Bayou Time Sports is brought to you by Terrible General Health Systems Community Sports Institute in conjunction with Barker Honda. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Bayou Time Sports, and I am Stan Grauwal sitting in tonight and very happy to be here as we talk about the summer and we got the guy who's going to let us know how to take care of ourselves and if there is a problem with heat during the summer, how to make sure that we do those right things. Brett Chasson, the manager of athletic trainers over at Terrebonne General's Community Sports Institute is here with us today. Thanks for giving up some time sitting with us. As uh, I think there's a misconception for you guys as athletic trainers that in the summertime, you don't have a lot to do, but suffice to say, maybe the busiest time of the year. Uh, what, what most people don't realize is that during the school year, you know, you have fall sports, winter sports, spring sports. During the summer, it's all sports. So literally it could be from six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. All sports are going on on campus. So there's no regulation by the Louisiana High School Athletic Association regarding summertime as far as that goes. If you want to play Swampland baseball, you play Swampland baseball. If you want to play in a basketball league, you can play in a basketball league, right? Absolutely. You could do your weightlifting, conditioning, summer leagues. It's uh, full force. So we're here to talk a little bit about how to take care of yourself in the summer. Obviously with heat issues, with hydration issues, we wanna make sure that we're doing this right, correct? That being said, let's not talk about the student athlete per se. Let's just talk about the general person, that, that person out there who is active during the summer. Any sort of tips that you have, just, just precaution type tips for anybody who's gonna go out and do some things that might cause some heat problems. So your biggest thing is getting acclimated to the heat. If you're a type of person that you know you have a lot going on in the summer where you will be outside uh, and you're not used to being outside, try to get outside, you know, for a couple minutes a day to try to start getting your body acclimated to being outside. Uh, you need to go ahead and prepare your body um, from a hydration standpoint, because whenever you are outside, you could be losing a lot of fluids, even though you may not realize how much you are losing. Uh, you definitely need to drink before, but also you need to replenish after as well. And also you need to make sure to eat your meals, uh, not skip meals, because in order to fuel your body to go ahead and perform and do stuff during the summer out in the heat, your, that food that you're intaking is your fuel in order to go ahead and keep your body going. Obviously, in what you do when you have to go out and deal at times with kids who are having problems, whether it's cramping up because of the heat or even maybe something as serious as a heat stroke, you see things. Are there any misconceptions or things that people do that you think to yourself, well, that was pretty logical. And the reason I say that is, is because I've even learned over the last, you know, at my age, how important breakfast is. Just something like having a good breakfast mm -hmm. that kind of fuels you for the rest of the day. Biggest, biggest sort of misconception or careless error that people make during the summertime. Oh man, it's uh, or is there I, a I, list? I, 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 th th there probably is a list, but I think you hit the nail on the head with most uh, kids. They, they want to sleep in as long as possible. So then they say, well, I didn't have enough time to eat breakfast. But what they don't realize is I always explain to them, if you don't put gas in your car, your car doesn't perform properly. So I tell them, you know, if you do want to sleep longer, maybe you need to prepare yourself from the night prior, get your meal ready where you can just wake up, get whatever you're going to intake and it's already be ready for you. So try to prepare yourself as much as possible to prior day so you can be successful in the morning with intaking your breakfast. And if you do want to sleep in, you possibly could sleep in a little bit longer since you spent more time the prior day preparing it. I mentioned the Louisiana High School Athletic Association. They came out with something, I think it was two summers ago, and I know Terrebonne General was good enough to get one of these instruments out to all of the schools, and it's a wet bulb global, global temperature. temperature. Yeah. What is that? And for a parent who might be going to high school because they have a student athlete playing there mm -hmm. and they see you guys out there with this measuring device, what exactly does that do? So pretty much most people know, you know, what the actual temperature is or what the heat index is. So what this device does, it takes into the actual radiant temperature, what the humidity is, how much wind is uh, flowing at the time. So it pretty much is a big old formula based off of all the heat elements coming from the sun and it gives us out a temperature. And then so we pretty much cross check that temperature to a chart. And then there's a chart that says, hey, you know, you can do three hours of activity. But within those three hours, you know, you have to give three separate water breaks for a minimum of three minutes a piece. 
Or it could get to a point where it says, okay, no outside activity at all right now. Wait till it gets cooler. So it doesn't, even though we are in South Louisiana, it doesn't get to that point often. Uh, over the past two, three years that we have been using it, probably five times, maybe we've gotten into the black area. But overall, it's just modifications of, hey, uh, if you are playing football that day and it is super hot, maybe you just go helmets that day. Because the biggest thing is that your heat is escaping your body. If you have all the pads on and everything, then that heat's unable to escape your body. And that's where you start getting into your heat exhaustion, heat stroke issues if the heat's not able to escape your body. Is it a deal where you as an athletic trainer pass this on to the coach and these coaches are sort of, I hate to use the word obligated, but they have to follow protocol and procedure mm -hmm. because the LHSA mandates this, right? You get off the field at a certain time because of the heat, right? Yeah, so uh, it's pretty much the best way to describe is we got like a group text of all the head coaches. So we'll go ahead and take the temperature and we'll forward on, hey, this is what the wet bulb glow temperature is now and these are the recommendations for the current workout period for this afternoon, this, this is what we have to do. Only about 40 seconds left in this segment, but could it be different in, say, Gibson, Louisiana, as opposed to Montague, Louisiana? Absolutely, because, it, it, like I said before, it takes into account cloud coverage, how much wind's flowing at the time. It could be over on, you know, South Terrebonne to, you know, Montague. It could be a couple miles, but it could be a big difference based off where the clouds are and everything like that. So it's really very accurate and it helps out, but it's based off of your exact location. What is the first thing, those, those, those signs that somebody might be struggling with heat? So if, if you were a group of people, uh, most of the time you kind of know what that person is normally like. If you with a group of people and this person starts lagging behind what they normally do or they're behind the group where they typically maybe might be the first or second person with that activity that they typically do and all of a sudden they're in the back they got their hands on their knees and you know taking long deep breaths and it just kind of struggling behind uh that's you know one of the typical signs that we look for you know as athletic, athletic trainers with the student athletes and everything like that but also, you know, if they start getting off balance as they're walking, um, the biggest thing that we try to do is prevent that before it occurs, you know, promote hydration, cooling off their body in between reps and everything like that. But from a, a, a standpoint of whenever you start getting red flags of whenever kids start kneeling down and starting getting hunched over on the ground and they're not wanting to get up whenever it is their turn, that's whenever, you know, we got to kind of step in and like, all right, hey, let's go off to the side. Let's try to cool your body down before we get into an emergency scenario. We'll talk about cooling the body down in just a little while and maybe ways that people just general layman like myself can help if there's a situation that arises. But there is a difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, right? Yeah. If, if you were to explain that to somebody in, in a quick couple of minutes, what, what might that sound like? So pretty much heat stroke is your emergency scenario where you start getting into 911. That's heat exhaustions where, you know, you probably get heat cramps prior to heat exhaustion. So most people know Charlie Haar's cramp where your calves start or your hamstrings which is definitely not fun, but you wanna to try to start stretching that out, make sure you hydrate. If you do get to that point, you're already dehydrated. Uh, the biggest way to go ahead and check if you're dehydrated or not is check what, how, what colors your urine. If it's darkened in apple juice, you definitely dehydrated. So if you check that the prior night before uh, and you see that your urine is in a dark color, you need to go ahead and start drinking so you can prepare yourself for the next day. But from an, uh, a standpoint of heat exhaustion, um, that person starts to kind of lag behind like I explained before. But when you start getting to heat stroke, that's whenever like the skin, it gets dry. Most of the time in heat exhaustion, they're still sweating. Whenever you get to the point that you start getting heat stroke, it starts to become dry, hot. And then that's whenever you get in more of that emergency scenario when I kind of spoke about, we need to go ahead and start cooling that body down rapidly. Real quick, this is the age old question. You need to drink water. How much water does a normal person need? So typically if you take your body weight and divide it in half in ounces, and that's how many ounces you'd like to go ahead and consume. So let's say somebody weighs 200 pounds, you wanna to try to at least consume 100 ounces of water. That's for an average person. If you're an athlete, you're gonna go ahead and expel a lot more water than that. So you wanna go ahead and try to increase above 100 ounces. These big tubs that you guys have, I've seen them out at the schools and uh, you know, we hope that they never have to be used, but that's in a case where somebody's just too hot. Is that a way of cooling somebody down? Absolutely. So the, the, the gold standard, if somebody is having a heat stroke, 
you want to try to cool the body down as rapidly as possible. So at all the high schools, we have a cooling tank. And if somebody does have, show sign of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, we want to go ahead and try to prevent that as much as possible in the early stages. So we try to cool their body down. So pretty much we go ahead and get them up to kind of armpit of water, try to cool their body down rapidly, get ice in there, circulate the water uh, to go ahead. Because if, if the water just stays stagnant, then that heat escape in the body is going to kind of create a, a heat, a hot water around. So you're going to kind of circulate that water around to keep that coolness kind of coming into the body. But the biggest thing is that you want to try to, if you do get to a heat stroke standpoint, you want to try to cool a person first before you transport them. So if your internal organs get so hot, your core body temperature gets so high, it's pretty much cooking all your, all of your intestines, everything. And that's why you want to go ahead and cool first before you transport you know, there was a day in time, my day in time, where sometimes that coach would say, you can't get water now. You, no water breaks, you know, whether it be a punishment or whatever. I, I would imagine that doesn't happen very much these days. It, from a standpoint of it's water's definitely there at all practices and everything like that. And we encourage athletes, you know, to drink prior, during and after. So it's not just one phase that you need to be drinking water. It's in all three phases, prior to activity, during, acti during activity, and after activity. And finally, in this segment, a tall tale sign to call 911. It's time. I know if you get them in a hot tub, somebody probably has called 911, mm -hmm. right? Excuse me, not a hot tub, a cold tub. Uh, you have called 911. Uh, other, other maybe key things to watch out for in this time to call an emergency. Your, your biggest thing is going to be uh, a change in mental status, uh, that person starts to become combative or you, they actually become unconscious. So it, once you get to the point of that change in mental status, uh, becoming unconscious is definitely an emergency scenario. You know, and you mentioned all of those things in the summer. Let's not forget, we, we're talking about baseball leagues and basketball leagues and seven on seven football, which you were at all morning this morning, actually. They still just doing weights and conditioning classes. This applies to anything that's outdoors mm -hmm. or even indoors that might be a hot situation, right? The biggest thing is that the indoor sports are now doing their workouts outside, doing their running and conditioning outside. And most of those athletes are more indoor people, so they're not used to the heat. So You're it's right. definitely something to think about. Hey, you know, I'm used to being indoors, but you know, you're going to be outdoors working out conditioning and things like that, even though you're indoor sport. So try to prepare your body in advance. I do want to ask just before we get into lightning, just protecting your skin. I mean, obviously we know with melanoma mm -hmm. and things like that, having a good protective coating of a, of a sunscreen mm -hmm. on is good. Does it help in any other, does it help as far as heat goes? Uh, I don't think from a heat standpoint, but obviously, you know, the biggest thing as a young adolescent, it's something that you don't see occurring right now. It doesn't hurt you right now. So you really don't think about it. Uh, but it's something that it's accumulation over time. And then if you're outside, you know, all summer long for 30 something years, and all of a sudden later on in life, you could be like, I should have put on sunscreen back then. I wouldn't have to be dealing with this. But it's, since it doesn't hurt you right now, that's why most people are more careless with it. So. I only ask that because I will go out sometimes in the summer and see a team doing weights and conditioning outside or put seven on seven or whatever it may be. And the coaches are loading themselves up, but you don't see the kids do it as much. And I always, and, and I always wondered how they kind of played in. One thing that is certainly always sort of a problem is lightning because we have it occur on, on you know, the snap of a finger in mm -hmm. South Louisiana. I realize different institutions have different protocols mm -hmm. for it. Just in general, when is it a good time to get out of the outdoors when there's lightning around? So typically, the biggest thing nowadays is that everybody has access to how far lightning is away, no matter what. Like you can download an app, weather bug, you know, local weather services, anything like that, and they typically will show you exactly where the lightning is occurring at, how far it's away from you based off your GPS and your phone. Uh, biggest thing is being informed and actually utilizing that. Um, from a standpoint of, you know, typically within eight miles of wherever you're at, that's whenever it's recommended to get off the field. The reason being is because lightning can go ahead, even though you have a weather band coming towards you, lightning can go ahead and jump up to six to eight miles in advance of that weather cell. So 
once you start getting within that eight miles, six miles range, even though it may not be raining at your location yet, you're still more susceptible to lightning strike or a possible lightning strike. So once you get in that eight mile range, six mile range, you're starting to kind of get in a danger area. So you need to try to start seeking. So that's not some guy with this pie in the sky. Oh, eight miles, we're gonna call eight miles. There's a scientific method to this that at any point within eight miles, it could be you within, Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, seconds, right? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's always good to know. You mentioned apps. I know on my phone, I I have a weather bug, folks, and it'll tell me where I'm standing and where the nearest lightning strike was. So I do understand that. Maybe that's a good thing to put on there. You mentioned, actually, in our first segment, the situation with the schools and student athletes probably being more busy in the summer than they are at any other point at a time. I want to read off some of the things going on in the summer. You have Swampland Baseball. You have seven-on-seven football with multiple leagues because I know E.D. White has a league. Terrebonne High now has a league. You have uh, Ellender High School has a basketball league. E.D. White has a basketball league. Uh, You have or had in the past a little small Swampland softball league that Mm -hmm. actually didn't play a lot, but they got out there and did some things. That's not to mention weights and conditioning and those things that go along with it. I'll go back again to that first segment. You said acclimation is everything, right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about band. Now, band doesn't do anything in the June, but they're going to be going back out Mm -hmm. there in July. For that band student out there, and God knows we have some great bands in our area, what would you recommend they do in June? Your biggest thing, like I said before, is just start getting outside. Because people don't realize the band's out there all day long whenever they start getting there. So they're on campus all day long. They don't keep the kids out side actually all day long but there's multiple times a day where they break up hey we could be outside for two hours and they're usually on that hot cement Mm -hmm. getting ready for things so uh the biggest thing is you know whenever we're in june right now start preparing your body get outside start being active uh even though you may not be doing anything specifically with the full band maybe go outside with your instrument and just start practicing yourself start getting your steps down acclimation is the key though you mentioned, uh, and I did too, also that you did a, you went and helped out at Terrebonne High School with a seven on seven situation where different teams from around the Bayou region and even the river mm-hmm. region come in. Uh, I just have to ask like steps in a day you'll put in just doing that. Oh, this morning, I think we we're at 13,000 just from eight to noon, but I mean, so obviously it's good for you to follow these protocols, but I can't imagine a kid who's actually going through the process of mm-hmm. doing the seven on seven and things like that. So we're trying to sort of implore to them, make sure you take care of yourself. So with about a minute left, biggest thing you'd like to hit home to any student athlete, even folks who are riding their bikes, folks who like to go out and run or maybe getting ready for a, you know, maybe not a triathlon, but a, Mm -hmm. but a 3k or a 5k or whatever you would say to them. Uh, Treat your body like whatever luxury car you dream about. If you take care and maintain it, it's going to be wonderful. If you don't get your all change, it's going to treat you like crap. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I never thought of it like that. Never thought of my body like a Mercedes or anything <laughs> either. But no, that makes a lot of sense. Certainly makes a lot of sense. Thanks for uh, sharing with us. And we hope during the summer, maybe you could come back and give us a few tips related to other things mm-hmm. that p- student athletes and the general public can just do to make sure they're taking care of that body. Sounds good. And girls basketball has a little traveling league going on too. Oh, summer. I forgot about girls basketball. <laughs> Don't want to forget about that. That's it for us, folks. Thanks to Brett for those wonderful tips. We'll be back with more Body Time tomorrow. Take care, everybody.